Hi, oh. I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so thrilled today to be talking about the new Peacock series, The End is Nigh. We are joined today by host, executive producer, and writer Bill Nye, as well as executive producer Erica Huggins, who is also the president of Seth MacFarlane's production company, Fuzzy Door, where she oversees development for all content, including film, television, literature, music, and digital. And I wanted to start by talking about the, the tonal approach of the show, because um, you make that acknowledgement that part of the inspiration of this series is the fact that when social anxiety is very high, we tend to lean in towards disaster movies, um, you know, and that's that's a type of entertainment that we really attach ourselves to. And I was interested in how that really informed a lot of the structure and the tone of the episodes, because it really brings us straight into the idea of potential disasters thematically with each episode, but then really ends with kind of a hopeful resolution towards the end. Well, yep. that's the whole idea, is we show you these disasters that are very reasonable, uh, one might say likely, and then instead of just having it end in a disaster, no, we come back. If we had systems in place, if we take an optimistic view of the future and embrace technology given to us by our understanding of science, we can save the world. Over to you, Erica. Well, and also we're trying to get people interested in hearing the conversation. And so engaging people with humor is always a good way to start a conversation. You know, Bill is pretty well versed in in humor and comedy. Certainly Fuzzy Door as a basis for a lot of the the pro programming and content that we've done in the past has had humor. I think that you, when you build that together with disaster, I think you actually do something that you don't get to see that often, which is like, we're scared, but we're also going to make people feel better about being scared because we're giving you solutions to the problem. And, and with that aspect of comedy, what's so brilliant about it is that, you know, when we laugh, it literally physically and mentally loosens us up. And so did you find that you were thinking very consciously about where you wanted to utilize comedy within the episodes and how you could essentially deliver and distill information differently by doing so in those moments. Yeah. Does that answer <laughs> your question? Yes. So the writing of the script, the writing of the uh, constructing of uh, the show when, and editing what you've written, that's all. That's the whole deal is the whole thing in comedy is timing, timing. <laughs> and so you got to get, you want to get the uh, jokes sprinkled in at the right rate in the right places to to keep the viewer engaged and relaxed yet focused yet yet i guess engaged is a good word paying attention well and so, to that end we you know bill you you've come in over and over to do you know to redo some of the dialogue to make sure that the timing is right so that you know we get those moments of levity at the right moment to, you know, allow the disaster to land, the scary, the fear to land, and then to compensate it by having, you know, Bill say something extremely witty. And finding wise. cargo <laughs> pants that look good. You can't, you just can't do it. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that is the challenge. And, but to Erica's point, we were, we were messing with it all the way down because all the way to the end, I mean, because you have a vision of, you know, whenever you look, everybody, when you're going to have a disaster movie in 21st century, you're going to have digital effects, but how it's going to ultimately look, you have to wait and see. You got green screens, you got people running across, you're pulling leg muscles, you're falling down, it's pouring rain, whatever. <laughs> you're doing these things. But then how it in how it uh, fits with the digital effects, you have to, in some ways, wait and see. Of course, they're placeholders or scratch track style digital effects. But then, to Erica's point, we would mess with the dialogue and voiceover back to the camera kind of things to make it to be as effective as we felt possible. And I'm so glad there that you're bringing up some of the visual effects because it's such an extensive production for every single episode in the way that it's told visually on screen, you know, with those effects, with multiple locations and settings, you know, we really have Bill kind of moving around between so many different spaces, depending on the information being presented to screen. And so I was interested, you know, within the episodes, 
what what a lot of those conversations were in terms of figuring out what visually makes the most sense of how we want to distill this information to to screen for the audience and you know figuring out a lot of those visual effect elements and where that would really enhance what you're telling us about well so it's science fiction in some ways right so you take science and our understanding of the natural world and then you project it into the future, neither distant future or any minute kind of future. And I've thought about to see, so Brandon Braga, who's not Erica, he's the <laughs> other guy involved. Uh, he worked on with Seth on Seth McFarlane on Cosmos. Uh, we were we we're both fascinated by the Twilight Zone and another show called Night Gallery. And I look back, do you know the story of the portrait of Dorian Gray? <laughs> where the guy never ages, but the portrait up in the attic does. And so this idea of using, of walking through some sort of imagined gallery, or in our case, institute, the disaster institute, and using that as a way to present these scenarios, we just thought that was cool. And then, then you take that, what this idea you think is cool, and that becomes um, the the setup or how we're going to uh, introduce today's show after this thing that is so popular now in television, with good reason, is the so-called cold open, where the show begins uh, cold without introduction. So then you get those two elements, then then the rest of the show can flow from there. That's my, um, as one of the writers, that's how I feel about it. The Disaster Institute is just kind of a fun, cool idea. And yeah. and when, when we started this, that was kind of what was posited. I mean, I think that's what got us going here is that it was clearly there was big ideas behind this, right? There was having a disaster every week, you know, having Bill, I think I can say it, right, Bill? Uh, Bill, kill Bill every week. And yeah, then I get bring killed. Him We're not allowed to say how I get killed. You got to watch. We can't that. say how, but we kill oh, Bill good. every week. Oh, we're, and we're but not. then we mitigate the the disaster with science, right? And you asked earlier about visual effects, getting them to tell the story accurately, scientifically accurately, and look cool, and be able to have some sense of spectacle. That was all Brandon and his team. And that's kind of where he comes from. You know, he was Star Trek and the Orville and he's, he's a, he's a visual master. And when you think about the way that he thought about this from the beginning, Bill with you and all of the um, writers and all of the experts that came in to give us help with this show, it was always in the back of his mind. Okay, how am I going to use the imagery to tell the to tell the story? And within that idea, you know, the show very successfully explores both the micro and the macro of of what you're discussing thematically throughout the episode. So if we take the first episode that's looking at storms, you know, you have a, a centralized character in that episode that you keep revisiting, who's a local business owner, and what how does this impact them and their life and everything that they've been working to build? And then you also have, you know, the much bigger concept of using archival footage and showing us storms that are ravaging communities around the world internationally. And so within each episode, how did you work to make sure that you were always servicing both of those elements of the story? Because the intimate thing really kind of connects to audiences on a different level. But then we get the true scope of it from that that international, from that larger scale as well. So, you know, this expression. So we have a team of writers. We have a head writer. Do you know who has the last say? Which writer <laughs> has the last say? The editor. That's the person right. sits there combining the video and audio effects. And so we have some excellent editors who are storytellers. And you sit there with Brandon and now and then me and these uh, 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 John and Tony, these guys who are expert editors. And they, the whole thing that you focus on, I believe, as a video editor is so-called pacing, which is, I guess, is a form I'm doing my best to answer the question we understand it 
is you have to pace the close-ups with the wide shots so that the story gets told. And we just had, my understanding more is you like the show. Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Yeah. So the pacing was good. That's good. Turn it up loud. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I was a former editor, and the thing that you realize in doing this is that there's a rhythm to things, and you can feel it when you're watching it. And because we watched it over and over and over to get it right, (laughs) and used Bill and had Bill come in over and over to make sure that the jokes and the things that were landing and the and the and honestly the the sort of more emotional gravitas moments were landing, so that you balance those things. And it constantly changes. But I think that the I, the big idea about having following a group of people, the bus, the young female business owner, the um, airplane uh, passenger, the, the passenger, and then the um, the scientists. Those were our three characters that we decided we needed that. And this was, I think, a big part of. Brandon's pitch from the beginning, in order to feel something, it can't just be out there. And it can't just be Bill. We need to see how it impacts people's lives. And I think that's where the emotion comes into. And with with all those elements in post-production and, you know, really finessing a lot of the the pacing, making sure that the information was landing, making sure that the timing was there for the comedy, were there any particular moments or, or episodes that were a little bit more challenging and just really figuring out those elements during that part of the process? Uh, well, I guess another important thing was how was the guy going to die? Yeah. <laughs> um, so... If you figure out how the guy's going to die, then you can work backwards to building the disaster over the 20 preceding minutes. And I I remember this moment very well in Brandon's backyard. Erica, you weren't there, my dear. But no, I wasn't. We're, we're in Brandon's backyard. This is COVID is going crazy. We're in Los Angeles. We're this, we're very far apart, talking to each other about the show <laughs> like this. And then it had this idea to get me drowned uh, and I'm holding on to the gate. Brandon has a fence in his backyard. I'm holding on to the gate. I'm holding on. I'm holding, and then I get swept away. <laughs> and we realized, or I believe we realized that that would be a cool moment that the guy would be there. Then he'd disappear, just suddenly disappear uh, in, in the flood, the swirling waters. And so that, uh, with that, then that uh, you take that moment. Is that going to be in a in a store? No, because he's outside in the flood. Is he going to be um, on high ground holding on to the last minute? No, he's going to get swept away. So you're going to put him. Um, uh, we ended up, you'll see, in a field <laughs> where the flood, where the. So imagine you guys. Uh, in North Americans, we get so much water, a hurricane so big, how big is it? It ends up in Tennessee. It's a long way inland, you know, a couple hundred nautical miles inland. And so that informs uh, how you construct in the details the the flood that leads to that. But then we have the scientist in the hurricane center. We have the uh, the politician ignoring the warnings. And then we have the guy in the airplane wondering, is sweating, wondering just what's going to happen to him when the airplane can't find a place to land. But also, I think your question was like, did or was one more difficult than the other? I uh, think yes. because we scripted everything, <laughs> just getting you back on track, though, because we scripted oh, everything, you're... we knew what we needed. We sort of had a, we, I mean, this was not just point the camera and shoot and see what you get and then build it in post. We had a very clear roadmap of what we were doing. Oh, so yeah. Yeah. The biggest thing was just, you know, our appetite with the budget and how many visual effect shots we could have and how big they could be and how much we could. So balancing those things with the stock shots that we used or enhanced stock shots, um, or what we had already shot, I think that was the big challenge in post, was just making sure that we stuck to the plan. So then um, how do you get electrocuted? 
Okay, so start with the electrocution and then work backwards. Um, how does a comet impact kill you if it doesn't hit you directly? How will a volcano kill you? Well, that's easy. <laughs> There's nothing to that. <laughs> and then, uh, and then, uh, what a happens? storm. And then what happens if uh, there's a huge tectonic movement and you get all these tsunamis? What do you do about that? What do you do when a nuclear power plant starts to have trouble and so on and so on? So once you figure out, once you decide rather, to Erica's point, once you decide on that element, then how much money can you spend to build to it? And I guess it turned out, Erica, more and more. Is that the money? Yeah. <laughs> We had good partners in our studio and our network. It's it's we're and we're excited about the way it turned out. I love that. I also wanted to ask about the research going into each episode because I imagine it was incredibly extensive. And I was interested if it was, you know, this is the research that we want to do to support the story that we want to tell and the direction that we see this episode going, or if if some of where the episodes ended up was dictated by where the research ended up going and, and what it ended up uncovering in terms of details. Well, so uh, two examples, one example that's pretty straightforward is uh, an old thing, you know, I'm head of the Planetary Society, and we uh, are very concerned about planetary defense, keeping the Earth getting hit by an asteroid. Well, we want to do something cool with the Earth getting hit with an object. And we have one of the writers and associate producers is um, uh, Andre Bormanis, who's an astronomer. And he got his master's degree in space policy and this and that. So instead of just an asteroid coming in, we had a group of comets and there's a phenomenon uh, in, in um, planetary science where an object like an asteroid gets broken apart by strong gravity. And the place you get that is Jupiter. There's strong the planet Jupiter. And then there are these um, groups of objects form that are called string, a string of pearls. All right, so then we consulted real astronomers. How long would you have after the comet goes by Jupiter and breaks into a string of pearls? Okay, now what happens? Well, we had very good consultation, and we worked out the storyline. I don't want to give too much away, where a bunch of these objects hit, but then there's quite a while before the next group hits. And it's that is absolutely science-based. So after you have that uh, science or that fact, then you construct the story to match that. It's much easier, everybody, to use real science to inform science fiction than to just make stuff up. Uh, when we were, Eric, when we were in this Montreal on the set, they were shooting, they had just finished shooting this film, Moonfall. That's right. The moon is hollow. The moon is not hollow. What? No, that. what's wrong with you? So you have to create all this wacky, unreasonable science fiction. I'm digressing, but just a little. We used real science. But we had we science. had climatologists and geophysicists and professors of geology. We had space and rocket engineers from, you know, SpaceX and NASA. We had we had Bill Nye. We had, um, we had some farmers. We had historians. Experts. We had authors. We had physicists on and experts on planetary impacts. I mean, we really got very specific, and so, so that we didn't get it wrong. Yeah. Well, the other thing is that's cool. All of these experts were very happy to participate. It was not. They really wanted. They wanted to tell the world, as the saying goes. When you're in love, you want to tell the world. I love volcanoes. No, like <laughs> if it blew up, there would be this pyroclastic death cloud. It would kill. It'd be so cool, you know. So we had these people who were experts and enthusiastic. I love that. I mean, it's it's such a great series, and you know, especially in the way that that I think you're always so fantastic at in distilling down the information in a way that feels very accessible, but also very connected to audiences. So, congratulations on everything with the series, and thank you so much to both of you for talking about it wow. with me today. Well, thank it. you for your support. Wow, Carrie, thank August you. August twenty fifth. Turn it up loud. Yeah, turn it up. August twenty fifth on Peacock.